Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hayyakum Allah jami'an Continuing on in our study of Baluga Maram The comprehensive book The chapter of those manners, those detestable manners, which contradict the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, meaning bab atarhi min masawi al akhlaq, and we left off in our last uh, lecture uh, at Hadith one thousand two hundred and ninety four, and this is a Hadith of Ibn Abbas radiyallahu taala anhum. And this is another hadith which illustrates and details for us those negative characteristics that we want to avoid as believers. Narrated Ibn Abbas, <coughs> narrated Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Don't dispute with your brother. Don't make jokes about him, and don't make him a promise and then break it. A Tirmidhi reported it with a da'if uh, chain of narrators. Uh, this hadith, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, this hadith, a hadith in uh, Tirmidhi, and it is a weak hadith. And... This hadith, although it is weak, the meaning is a sound meaning. Meaning the text itself, although it, it cannot be attributed to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but those general principles, they go in accordance with other nasus. And in this hadith, It was alleged that the Messenger وسلم, said, Don't dispute with your brother, don't make jokes about him, and don't make him a promise, then break it. And we know that from other ahadith that we studied prior to this, that uh, ridiculing and ghibah and uh, you know, ridiculing people, likewise, uh, making promises, making promises being from those characteristics of nifaq, those uh, hypocritical characteristics, and that these are all traits that are mithmum, and that's why Ibn Hajr, rahmatullahi he classified this hadith, or put this hadith in this uh, chapter, in the chapter of wicked mannerisms. And because all of these characteristics are negative characteristics, which are unbefitting of the uh, believer, and we can see from other nusuls, even though this hadith is a weak ha uh, hadith, weak in its chain of narrators, uh, this hadith of Tirmidhi, it's still in its meaning, uh, we, we uh, know that the meaning is a sound meaning, meaning that these traits are mevmuma, and that is known from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith, hadith 1295, narrated Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There are two characteristics which are not combined in a believer, miserliness and bad character. A Tirmidhi, a tirmidhi reported and there is weakness in its chain of narrators. So this hadith also is a hadith which uh, is also a weak hadith and again it also contains uh, those uh, mentions, those characteristics which are methmuma. These are two characteristics which are methmuma, which are sinful. And as we mentioned, although it's a it's a, not an authentic hadith, however, the meaning is sound, and we know that from many uh, a hadith. And for example, some of the prophetic du'a 
that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, seek a refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a bukhul, from uh, miserliness. And we talked about miserliness as some of those characteristics of Muma in the beginning of this chapter, uh, as well as, uh, you know, having wicked akhlaq. And we just talked about that in the last uh, lesson about those uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam supplicated to Allah azza wa jal to, for seeking refuge and seeking protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking refuge in Allah from those wicked uh, characteristics uh, of, especially of uh, uh, wicked akhlaq in general, that that is unbefitting of a Muslim. Because, as we know from one of the ahadith that we, we already uh, mentioned, on count we've mentioned on countless occasions, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, Su'ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, An akhtari ma yadkhul al-nas al-jannah, qala taqwa Allah wa husnu khulq. Wa su'ila, An akhtari ma yadkhul al-nas fi al-nar, qala afam wa faraj. And I believe this is a hadith of uh, Tirmidhi. And this hadith shows us uh, that these, in, in general, that akhlaq, that manners, it counts, that manners, are one of the paths to Jannah, that good manners is one of the ways, is one of the characteristics of the people who attain Jannah. That's, in, that's absolutely, uh, sh it, it verifies for us that that's imperative that we have this understanding, that we know and understand that uh, righteous conduct and that controlling our, ourselves and our manners and, and restraining our tongue is important. So in that hadith, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, The Prophet ﷺ was asked about what are those things which uh, mostly lead people to, that, that are some of the things which mostly, that lead people the most to paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ said, He said it's taqwa, it's fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and righteous manners. So it shows us that those are two imperative uh, manners and akhlaq and all of the good that are surrounding those characteristics that the Muslim needs to have those characteristics because those are the things that help them get to Jannah. And as we talked about before, taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is adhering to the commands of Allah and uh, avoiding his prohib prohibitions. And that the husn al-khulq the righteous conduct and righteous manners, that is sham, that includes all of those things. That could be something with the tongue, it could be smiling, it could be, uh, you know, lending money to someone in need, or giving sadaqah to someone in need, or speaking a good word, or all kind of various ways in which we can do righteous conduct to our families and to other than our families, to Muslim and non-Muslim. And just having good adab with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala by worshiping him and him alone and, and avoiding uh, ridiculing his religion subhanahu wa ta'ala and by following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is also a part because that's how we learn what good manners are. So all of that is a part of that ma'roof and all of that uh, is contained in husn al in righteous conduct. So those are the characteristics that we want. And so from this hadith, although it is uh, not an authentic hadith, we know we need to stay away and avoid miserliness by being, you know, holding on to that wealth and not spending in righteousness and being uh, being miserly. And we uh, need to uh, avoid having bad character, bad character, and bad conduct in general. And that's the whole. And that's why we see that this hadith is listed uh, in this uh, in this bab. In the next hadith. The next hadith uh, is a hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, hadith 1296, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, when two men revile one another, what they say is held against the one who began it, as long as the one who is wronged does not transgress the limits in responding. Ru'ahu Muslim, this hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, alerted his ummah 
to character a characteristic which should be avoided and that's why Ibn Hajar listed it in this chapter because this characteristic of of um, uh, speaking and reviling uh, one's brother in Islam that this is a uh, a negative trait which the uh, mu'min should avoid so this hadith it clarifies uh, two very important things the first is that the act of avenging oneself on someone who has committed an inequity meaning someone who has wronged you and uh, uh, you know you have a right you have a haq that you can defend and it's fair and permissible to be equitable in uh, gaining your right from them or that maltreatment. Uh, another important point is secondly, the whole sin shall be incurred by the one who starts the quarrel and perpetuates it as long as the other party does not exceed limits by committing an aggression. And despite all of this, we know as we've mentioned prior to this that the best of those is who is the one who who overcomes all of that and doesn't take retribution or doesn't and, and grants respite and forgiveness to someone who's even wrong done them wrong so this is the one who has is in the best uh, situation uh, with regards to these uh, negative characteristics but however though and the one who is on the um, who is the recipient of this negative treatment, meaning that someone else began the fitna, began the uh, bad speech and so forth, that the person who responds, they're still in a better position because they did not start it. They were not the one who initiated this, but in fact, maybe they're defending themselves. Maybe they are just getting their right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. Uh, what we learn from some of the benefits of this hadith is uh, first that it is not permissible for the uh, Muslim to uh, to curse his brother to revile his brother we see that that is one of those uh, one of those characteristics which are sinful and wicked and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and unbefitting of the believer. So this is impermissible. And another uh, benefit we gain from this hadith and also in, in relation to that first benefit is that we see from other ahadith where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam especially illustrated that when a person is fasting that if they have been cursed or reviled that they restrain themselves and that's what fasting is supposed to teach us. It's supposed to teach us not just to refrain from eating and drinking but refrain from wicked akhlaq. That's one of the ways we counter and contradict and arm ourselves with a defense against Masawi al-Akhlaq. Uh, against wicked mannerisms. And so, uh, in, in the hadith where the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, in the sababahu ahad, o in sababahu ahad, o shatabahu falyakul, inni sa'im. That if someone curses or reviles a person, while they're fasting, then they should say, and the Prophet Sallallahu commanded this, then, then say, Inni sa'im, verily I'm fasting. So that is evidence to show that fasting is a means for, you know, for, uh, for refraining from these wicked manners. That fasting only helps one to inculcate in themselves righteous conduct and manners and it's a way it's a defense it's better in nisa'im prevents you from reacting and reciprocating in a way in which you'll transgress because that will take away from the edger that you gain from your uh, fasting so that is the way the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, taught us to react to when somebody is uh, illustrating 
uh, you know, this wicked trait of cursing and reviling people. And that brings up another point that I want to mention, that even in refuting people, we have to be careful, we have to be balanced. And that it can be very difficult when sometimes we have people who are really from the people of, of bidah and desires to such an extent that they harm the reputation of Islam. And what I'm talking about specifically for what, when we're talking about takfiris and people who distort the religion and curse people and make takfir of other believers and curse and attack the leaders and things like this, that sometimes we can have an emotional reaction and we can go... Uh, in reacting, refuting them, which is perfectly permissible, and in fact can be an obligation upon those people who have the knowledge and the tools and able to refute those shibahad and refute those individuals and refute those negative ideologies which are foreign to Islam, that it may be wajib upon them. But we want to not transgress. That means we want to not belittle ourselves and gain sin in that by exaggerating. It's not permissible to lie, and it's not permissible to, to really curse and, you know, go outside those bounds of, you know, transgressing the limits in the way that you respond even to those individuals and their wicked khawarij-like traits. Wallah musta'an. Another benefit that we gain from this hadith at hand is that the one who begins the... Fitna, or reviling his brothers and sisters in Islam, that this person, they get the sin directly. They get the sin directly, and that's in accordance uh, with the statement of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said in the Hadith, he said, uh, when two men uh, revile one another, what they say is held against the one who began it. So right there in that ibadah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us that when the two people, when there's fitna that arises, the one who began that fitna, they're going to get that sin. So that is an important lesson that we have to, uh, that we have to reflect upon. And we have to put that into our practice, that be careful about how you speak about individuals and about reviling individuals um, and, you know, having those traits which are traits of uh, that are sinful traits and characteristics another benefit of this hadith is that we see uh, in this hadith also we learn or one of the benefits from this hadith is that it, it also clarifies or illustrates the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the wisdom of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala uh, and his reward, and how he rewards his servants, and how he gives those people who are uh, who begin fitna and begin reviling people, how he gives them their just punishment, and that's from the wisdom of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that's from his justice, and so we we see that because. Uh, as it's illustrated, and this is derived from the, the statement in the hadith where the messenger Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi said, Ma lam ya'tadil madhloom. As long as this person, meaning this is the person who is receiving uh, the being cursed and so forth, as long as they don't transgress uh, you know, the boundaries of being um, oppressed, you know, that they don't uh, oppress the oppressor, in a sense, you know, respond by going beyond the bounds. You have a right to defend yourself, but not to make fitna more and not to, to go beyond the bounds. So this is from, this illustrates the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his justice that he subhanahu wa ta'ala considers everything. And, And verily, there is nothing that escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this earth uh, or in the uh, heavens. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from those traits and forgive us of our many, many sins. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Abu Sirma, 
Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, He who causes harm to a Muslim will be harmed by Allah. And he who acts in a hostile manner against a Muslim will be treated in a hostile manner by Allah. Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi reported it, and the latter graded it as Hassan. This is a, a sound hadith. In the hadith of Abu Simra, radiallahu ta'ala, we see that this hadith is in the chapter of Masawi al-Akhlaq, you know, those wicked traits, because it shows that harming a Muslim in general falls under the category of uh, Masawi al-Akhlaq, you know, of bad manners in conduct or wicked conduct. So it's very important that the believers are conscious of this. And this requires a new way of thinking for many of the people because unfortunately, especially when you live in Muslim countries and you're in Muslim uh, populate, populated areas, a lot of times we take for granted that fact and we you know, do not see anything. Uh, we don't value Islam in the same way. So we treat one another in the worst of ways. And a, a case scenario is that I find many of the youth cursing one another and cursing and, and, and sending the curses upon Allah, upon one another in joking manners. Cursing one another and, and invoking Allah's curse on each other just as a joke. Uh, calling each other uh, donkeys and himars, calling one another dogs, calling, uh, making racist remarks towards one another, like nothing. And those are people who are even friends a lot of times. So we're not even talking about the adawa, the 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 the, the sinfulness, and 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 the the enmity that's that becomes between uh, people. How quick we are to revert to those wicked traits, and that's why it's important for the believer. They don't. The nationalistic identity is not what is the most important thing, but it's your Islamic identity that you, this is what's going to make the difference, uh, uh, you know, for your 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 paradise and your hereafter. Is that you're adhering to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not the fact that you're from America or you're from Saudi Arabia or you're from Ethiopia or you're from Somalia or you're from Pakistan, or you're from India, or you're from Bangladesh. You're, those things are not. Those things are absolutely irrelevant. They have no uh, value as far as you're hereafter. Absolutely not. They're not going to be at all a wasila for you, a means for you to get to paradise. But however, as we saw, as we mentioned prior to this, you know, it's those husn al it's those righteous manners, and it's your adherence to Islam, adherence to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have to be very careful about those. Uh, you know, having wicked, uh, you know, illustrating negative and wicked uh, traits. The uh, benefits that we learn from this hadith first is this hadith, the hadith of uh, Simra, that it uh, is a stern warning uh, for those for those two characteristics that are mentioned in the hadith. First, harming a Muslim and being hostile. Uh, you know, treating uh, people with hostility, that these are wicked traits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with. So this uh, hadith is a stern warning against those, those characteristics. Number two, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also is a stern warning for those people who cause difficulty upon the believers, upon their uh, believing Muslim brothers and sisters. And that can be in many ways for those charged in authority, for making difficulty upon the believers, those their subjects they rule over, or the head of a family, though those who are under them, making things difficult for them. And likewise, and, and, we, and we studied that in detail in some of the previous uh, lessons, uh, and likewise, even by causing fitna for the believers. And how can that be? For ex example, when we have those extremist takfiris, as we mentioned prior, that these uh, individuals 
who cause fitna in the name of Islam, who taint the whole religion of Islam. And they uh, destroy the da'wah of Tawheed in the Book of Allah, and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as, a, you know, that Ahl Sunnah is trying to propagate and invite people to Islam and to the righteousness and the beautiful characteristics and conduct of Islam, but these people show only beheadings and only kidnappings and only enslaving people and only uh, destruction and bloodshed around the earth and wicked and evil and demonic acts. And then they have the nerve to say it's in the name of Islam. And then they claim that this is fi sabilillah, this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu mistan. And so this is a wicked, these are the people who view Siduna fil ard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. They are the ones who, who cause wickedness and sinfulness throughout the earth. And then they say, Muslimun. They say, we are the ones who are making uh, Islam. We're the ones rectifying the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counters them by saying that, no, you are the ones who are the criminals. You are the ones who are the wicked sinners who are causing fasad around the earth, wickedness around the earth. And what does that do? That harms the characters of the believers. It harms the... Uh, uh, people's image of Islam, it gives people a, a, a wrong image of what Islam is, and it also causes harm for the believers wherever they go. In Muslim lands, especially governments that have that are more secular, they crack down on the believers for this. You know, they crack down on the, the regular uh, Muslims who are not a part of that those wicked and evil sins, and they, con they crack down on the symbols of Islam. No more hijab, no more... Uh, niqab, no more beard, no more this, no more that. So it, it only causes facade. So those people, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, fit under that character there, that uh, fit under that crit that, uh, you know, have exhibited that wicked trait and fit the criterion of being of those who spread wicked, wickedness and harm to the believers. Even if it seems indirect. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is this hadith also shows us the importance of having, uh, of respecting the honor of the believers. So you have to be respectful uh, of people's, uh, their honor, okay, and who they are, their status, and so on and so forth, that those things are important, and that's that's important for human beings, and it's especially important for the believer, and that's why there's so there's even punishments for slandering the believing women and the believing men about zina and saying things about them that are untrue. You know, one will be receive a a hud a, a lash lashes for that, showing that what a person's honor is is something sacred. The mu'min's honor, especially, is sacred. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates a qaida or principle that we've mentioned many times, which is al-jaza and al-jaza min jins al-amal. That the reward for something is commensurate with its, with the thing that you've done. So meaning, in this hadith, how we see that illustrated is that the person who causes harm for the Muslim, Allah will punish, give him harm. Allah will harm them. So that means the punishment is commensurate with the crime or with the sin. You committed this sin, your punishment is uh, alike. Okay? And there are many uh, ahadith that we've studied that uh, illustrate this, this concept. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is... This hadith also shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, defends the, his, his servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends his servants. And that those people who try to harm them or those people who harm them, they will receive a punishment either in this life and the hereafter or in the hereafter. So it's very important to not be of those who harm even if it's the honor of the believers that we have to be very cautious about having those negative characteristics, and may Allah forgive us of our many, many sins. Amin, Ya Rabbil uh, Another benefit, as there are many benefits of this hadith,
uh, another benefit of this hadith is that This hadith uh, also affirms the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ilm illah, uh, azza wa jal, and his qudra, and his ability, and his hikmah, and his mercy, and his justice. So this hadith is an illustration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It affirms that Allah the Almighty is uh, the omnipotent, and he is the, uh, you know, he has divine wisdom. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is the uh, most merciful, and he is the most just, tabarak wa ta'ala, and that justice will be met out. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that it is impermissible to harm a believer uh, and, and give difficulty to the believer. So it's very important to always keep that door of mercy open. Another last benefit uh, we want to mention in regards to this hadith is that the, the person uh, who uh, deals with people with kindness and ease, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them in kind with ease and uh, gentleness. So it's very important that if you want to receive gentleness and kindness from your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we all are in need of and we all want, that you treat others with those characteristics that you want to, uh, with those, you know, you treat others with those same uh, characteristics. So that way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy and kindness and gentleness with you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be of those who are those who are kind and gentle. In the next hadith, hadith 1298, narrated Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily Allah hates al-fahish, meaning the one who acts shamelessly, and al-badi, who uses obscene language. A Tirmidhi reported it and graded it as sahih. Uh, this hadith is a hadith which is also a part of another hadith uh, or a longer a part of a, a longer narration where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ma min shayin athkalu fi mizan al-mu'min yawm al-qiyama min husn al-khulq وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُبْغِضُ الْفَاهِشَ الْبَذِي Which, in this hadith, and as we've mentioned this hadith prior to this, the Prophet والسلام, said that there isn't a thing which weighs heavier on the scale of a believer than righteous conduct. And then we talked about righteous conduct being shamil, being something that is all inclusive of all of those various manners, whether it's manners of the tongue, whether it's manners of the uh, limbs, the all righteous deeds of the limbs, that all of this ma'ruf and all these kindnesses fall under righteous conduct. And so this hadith, in its complete form, it includes both that which is uh, righteous and those uh, traits that we need to avoid and be away from. And that's why Ibn Hajar, Rahmatullah alayhi he put it in this chapter, the Bab uh, Tarheeb min Masawil al And that's why he listed this hadith uh, under this category of hadith, uh, um, or, or compiled it in this section of his book, because these uh, are wicked uh, characteristics. Being a fahish, meaning someone who speaks. Uh, who acts uh, shamelessly, and Al Badi is the one who, uh, you know, speaks shamelessly. You know, speaks with wicked uh, speech. So it shows that all of these these are uh, wicked traits, which are medhmuma that we have to avoid, and is not befitting of the believer. And as I mentioned uh, already, 
that unfortunately these types of uh, these conduct this conduct has become rampant amongst many Muslim youth and even elders who use uh, horrendous language and who have horrendous conduct plain and simple many of the people they have these traits uh, of, of and so we have to do our best to avoid this wicked these wicked traits which contradicts the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, with regards to this hadith, uh, the term, some of the terminologies, uh, for example, where the Prophet والسلام, said Al Fahish, uh, Al Fahish, this refers, or Al Fush, the, the actual action, Al Fush. Uh, it's a noun, and this is a, this refers to both uh, statements of speech and actions. So it's included. And this includes the person who, uh, uh, you know, wicked speech. It includes wicked speech, and it inc and also includes uh, wicked uh, actions, wicked conduct. So all of that fits under uh, al fush and al fahish in this uh, hadith is in reference specifically to the uh, the one who has uh, you know the the fahish in their their uh, conduct in their conduct and we know that because the, the prophet alayhi salatu salam talked about al fahish and then he said al badi and al badi is ref in reference to as we mentioned, the actual uh, speech, you know, wicked and sinful speech. And both of those are uh, traits which are uh, negate righteous conduct and are the exact opposite. From the fawaid or benefits of this hadith, some of the benefits we see is this hadith uh, affirms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has both. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a, a wrath and he has anger. He becomes anger, angry, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, at some uh, certain traits and certain conduct and at disbelief, thing, people who disbelieve in him, disbelieve in his religion and disrespect his deen, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that because... In the hadith, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah yubghidu al-fahish al-badi. Uh, Verily Allah hates wicked and sinful, wicked uh, conduct and sinful, shameless speech. So we see that in this hadith, it affirms for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests certain actions. And this is also where the qaida are uh, in those principles of al wala wal bara they emanate from that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves things and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests dis, dis, detests things certain things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates he doesn't like that you disbelieve in him he doesn't like that you uh, 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 have wicked and sinful speech as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam illustrated he doesn't like that you lie or you uh, speak about him without knowledge Subhanahu wa ta'ala, or all of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al kirim in Surah al Saf, Qabra maqtan indallahi. That this is very serious that you speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, without, you know, uh, you know, or that a person does, Ya uh, yuladina amanu lima tukuluna ma la tafalun. O oh, you who believe. So preceding that ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, he addresses the believers. Oh, you who believe, why do you do, why do you say that which you do not do? Why are you advising people with this and you're doing it? Why are you commanding the good but not forbidding the evil on yourself? Or why are you forbidding the evil on others and not forbidding it on yourself? And that this is major to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests. And so that is uh, very important 
that we have this understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests certain uh, characteristics and actions and statements. And likewise, he loves certain actions and statements and he loves the believers, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also warns us against the trait of fahsh, of having, uh, you know, wicked, uh, wicked uh, speech, wicked and sinful speech, and wicked and sinful uh, actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests this stuff. Uh, this hadith also is a warning against, you know, being harsh with people and especially harsh and using harsh and wicked speech and slanderous speech. All of this falls under those character, those, those traits of, uh, of, of, of Fahish, of the traits of, 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 of Fahish and Al-Badi. Al this all falls under that. And so we have to beware and be careful of possessing those wicked and sinful uh, traits. In the next hadith, <clears throat> Hadith 1299, also Tirmidhi related it, reported it from the Hadith of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'anhu, who narrated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi as saying, a believer is not given to accusing others falsely, nor cursing them, nor acting shamelessly, nor speaking obscenities. A Tirmidhi graded it as Hassan, and Al Hakim graded it as Sahih, authentic. However, a Darakutni held that the stronger view is that it is Mokuf, meaning saying of a companion. So, this narration, whether it be Mokuf and letting us know that this was from the method, methodology of the Salaf and attributed to the statement of a companion, as Imam Al Darakutni said, and others. Uh, disagreed and held another view as far as this whether it's attributable to the Prophet والسلام, or not that we see that these traits are uh, wicked and sinful and they go uh, these wicked and sinful traits are in accordance with the other uh, wicked and sinful traits that we already mentioned or meaning that they are, these are traits that we already have from other ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, that affirm for us that these are uh, these are sinful and wicked traits that you cannot curse the believer, you cannot speak wicked against the believer, you cannot uh, you know you should avoid wicked and sinful speech and behavior in general. So that's why this hadith is in this bab of tarhib min masawi lakhlaq and. What we learn from this hadith, some of the benefits from this hadith that we've already uh, covered in other uh, hadith is the impermissibility of having, uh, you know, of cursing people and attacking people's honor and attacking people's race. This shows us this is a prohibition of uh of racism, as Ben Othimin, he mentions that this here that uh, because the message, because as was mentioned in the narration about the ta ta'an and la'an and al fahish and al badi, that these were the four traits that were mentioned in this uh, this uh, narration, and a ta'an this uh, refers to uh, a trait. That is a negation, you know, that it uh, takes away from a person's iman. And this is a, a trait of basically of racism. This is of a, 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 a cursing and attacking a person's tribe or uh, their actions or their, their, their uh, physical looks or their race. All of these fall under this, that, that a person who speaks... And, you know, uh, has this type of prejudicial speech, this wicked prejudicial speech against one's race or physical characteristics 
or their tribe, that all of this falls under ta'an. And the other characteristic that was mentioned, al-la'an, and this is for a mu'min, this is also befitting for the uh, unbefitting of the believer, and this is when a, uh, and, and uh, the mu'min doesn't, shouldn't do this at all. You know, that's when a person is cursing uh, someone. Uh, and, and what's very important for us to understand that the, in the Arabic language, the siga, the siga or the, the, the scale that is used, or the wasn't that's used with these, these terminologies is showing us that these are characteristics that mean kathra. So, for example, if you say ta'an al-nasab, ta'an aliyun nasab khalid that Ali, he uh, slandered or spoke ill of Khalid's uh, heritage. Okay? The, 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 the verb ta'an, ta'ana, this is a verb in the past tense. Okay? This is what we call fi'l madi uh, so we would say this is the simple past in English. And, but when you say ta'an, this means that this person, this is the fa'an, this is the person who does this action. And because it's mushadda, you know, it shows that they do it a lot. So it's not that they did it once and they made a mistake and they made toba. Like, for example, we have a particular individual who is, uh, you know, sometimes people who are in positions of dawah. And they make racist statements, some of them, which is not acceptable at all. But perhaps they've done it once or twice. This is way too many times, and it's sinful. But the person who does this a lot, then that is, they fall under a ta'an. They fall under this trait of, of, uh, of doing this action excessively. Or the la'an. This is the one who curses excessively uh, 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 slanders people excessively you know curses them like you say the person who makes dua against someone and they say la'an Allah alayhi you know may Allah curse him that's very big you're asking that the mercy of Allah be removed from that person that's what you're asking and that's how they talk about speak about this terminology in in in, in Arabic that you're saying that you are asking for the rahmah of Allah to be removed from that individual when you say la'ana alayhi you know you, you curse him and so that's a very big thing and it's unbefitting for the believer especially to do that with another uh, believer so and the one who does that excessively they're called a la'an and likewise al-fahish uh, and this is the one who has the, uh, as we said, the, the wicked uh, speech, or it could be the wicked uh, actions, you know, as wicked and sinful uh, conduct and, 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 and actions. So this could be physically physical actions in which they are wicked and evil towards others, or this could be the uh, through the tongue, like al-badi. So it's very important we see from this the, that these are sinful traits that the mu'min has to avoid by any and all means. And that's why Ibn Hajr, Rahmatullah alayhi, Rahmatullah wasiyah, he put this in the Baba Tarheed bin Masawi al-Akhlaq. This is in the chapter of those wicked and, and, and sinful, uh, and wicked and sinful manners. In the next hadith, Narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do not revile the dead, for they have come to what they have sent before them. Al-Bukhari reported it. Uh, this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. In uh, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which is also under the Bab uh, Tarheem in Masawi al Khak. So we're still talking about those characteristics which are Mithmuma, which are sinful. And from those m wicked and sinful characteristics that the Mu'min must avoid is reviling the dead. And what we know uh, and understand is 
is that by cursing the dead and speaking ill of the dead, especially especially if it wasn't someone who was known for wicked and evil actions that uh, in general a person should try to avoid this trait and that way you safeguard yourself. So we see that the this hadith is ban uh, or clarifies the prohibition of reviling the dead in general. And there's much debate about whether that includes disbelievers as well. And in general, it shows if the mu'min wants to be ahwat, to be safest and strongest in their belief, they will avoid these characteristics at the lock. They will treat the Muslim and the non-Muslim with kindness. They will not curse the mu'min that is past, nor the disbeliever. And there you safeguard yourself. The one who's excessive in cursing and speaking about people, it's so easy for them to fall into sin and to increase in misguidance and sinfulness. From the fawaiyat of this hadith, one of the benefits of this hadith is the prohibition from uh, cursing the dead and making, uh, you know, speaking ill of them. And for one, we see, and as Ben Othimi points out, la fi. There's no benefit in that. In fact, you'll find no benefit in the one in in doing these actions. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith is also pointing us to be conscious of those things which harm others. And for example, think about. The one, when you get into a gathering, and especially those who mix with non-Muslims on their jobs or in, in their country, wherever they may be, or even family members or what have you, if you were to curse someone who is dear to them, sometimes it's even as far as entertainment. And I will say this, for example, uh, even entertainers, if you go in certain communities, for example, in my community as far as from my racial background and heritage, African-American community. Someone who's highly regarded amongst uh, a lot of people in certain age groups that still held as big would be Tupac Shakur. Now, whether you think he has role model-like characteristics or not, that's besides the point. But if you were in certain gatherings and you curse him, people would take offense and that will not do you any good as far as Dawa. But instead, it will make the people detest you. So that's where you see that, uh, as Ben Othimin mentioned, la faille de fi. There's no benefit in cursing the dead. They've already gotten what they, they have, you know, they were already, you know, they're in to Abu Barzakh. They're into the hereafter. They, their deeds have uh, ended. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, their deeds have ended except three. إِذَا مَاتَ الْمَرِيَ انْقَتَ الْعَمَلُهُ إِلَى مِنْ ثَلَاثِ uh, that when a person dies, their deeds cease except three. The, the continuous charity, the uh, uh, you know, knowledge that benefits other people, and a righteous child that supplicates for them on their behalf. So their deeds have stopped. They're already going to be, they're in the, the process of, of being judgment. They don't have, of being judged. They don't have the opportunity to do in anything else to improve their condi condition or worsen their condition. Their state is already finished in this life. They've already entered in the Dar al Jaza. And as the Salaf used to say, a dunya, a dunya, Dar al Amal, wal akhira Dar al Jaza, or Kamakil. That the Salaf used to say that this life is the, the time for actions, or time for actions and deeds. And the hereafter is the time for rewards. Because you're going to get what you, what you did in this, this life. And so it's very important for the believer to be conscious about what they're saying and about speaking about the dead. And cursing the dead. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that it is not befitting... For a person in general to speak about those things that have la fi that have no benefit with them. 
And this goes and is illustrated in other narrations where the Prophet ﷺ said, for example, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ مَنْ كَانَ مُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخَرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا وَلَيَصْمَقْ Whoever is a believer in, the, in Allah in the hereafter, then say something good or keep silent. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and protect us from kufr, shirk, and nifaq. And anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد